Okay, good morning, everyone. It is 10 a.m. Time for the Tuesday, February 13th meeting of the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee, which will begin, as is our custom, with all of us rising and joining Representative Harrington as he leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Thank you and good morning to everyone. Thank you for your attention this morning. We have a full committee work session that we will conduct from now until we have exhausted the matters before us, the discussion matters before us. But before we start that work session, we have some announcements that we want to discuss with the committee. After we finish the work session, by the way, there will be a Republican caucus in this room, and then we'll have a lunch break, and then we'll be back here at one o'clock for an executive session. So last week, we had uh, some discussion about the proper way to make a motion on a bill that we want to amend, and then how to move the amendment, and how to vote on the amendment. And I suggested at the time that we didn't have to vote on the amendment. And some people questioned that. So I went to the clerk and had an extensive conversation with him. And this is a subject that had come up several times before. In fact, the clerk had had uh, a discussion about it in a chairs and vice chairs meeting. And at that meeting, he did state that you do not have to have a roll call on an amendment. You can vote on an amendment with a show of hands. And there was a bunch of back and forth discussion after he made that statement. And it got confusing after a while and I came away from the discussion thinking that we did not have to vote on an amendment based on the different threads that emerged during that discussion. So the clerk clarified for me last week that we do have to vote on an amendment. It can be a roll call vote or it can be a show of hands. I think you can even do a vo voice vote if you want but you do have to vote on the amendment. So going forward, we will always vote on an amendment separately and then vote on the motion of ought to pass as amended. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think, and, and uh, to that end, uh, regardless of how it's done, I believe the clerk still has to check off each box for each member as how they voted. So um, however we do it, I believe it needs to be recorded on, on paper as well. Mr. Clerk, uh, do you concur with that observation? That is consistent with the training that I originally had uh, two years ago. So if it was a vote by a show of hands, people would have to hold their hand up long enough for you to actually go through and check off each members vote? Yes. Okay. So if we do do a voice, uh, not a voice, but a show of hands vote, I will try to remind everybody to keep your hand raised until the clerk indicates that he has recorded your vote. Mr. Chair, Representative McGee. If it appears no. Yes, as long as we see everybody's hand. Well, we'll have to ask everybody to raise their hand at that point. So are there any additional representative partial? Thank you, Chair. I think this is a, a softball question, but what is the status of this particular bill right now? Are we going to bring the bill back to executive committee for a vote, or is it, uh, are we just looking towards the future? So the clerk said that the bills that we exec last week are good to go. Even though we didn't do the process correctly, they're still good to go. 
because there was nothing terribly con controversial about, about any of the bills. So we don't have to redo the ones we already did. We just have to do it correctly going forward. Okay. Now, Representative Bernardi has been working to put together a trip to ISO New England, and he would like to talk to you about that. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think most folks saw my email, and I have uh, confirmation from several people that they are interested in going and interested in, in the van. So um, let me just indicate who has said yes. Uh, so Representative Corman said yes, but may not take the van. Representatives Noel, Ploget, Brezhny, McGee, Kaplan, uh, Wendy Thomas, Doug Thomas, and Janine Nodder, as well as myself, have all said yes. Is there anybody else who, okay. Um, You're likely. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, the other subject that I uh, put in the email that I wanted some feedback on uh, was what, were there any specific topic areas or subject areas that you wanted uh, ISO New England to be ready to respond to, to um, uh, answer? A question that you're going to put forward to them that, so that they're they're ready for that or um, uh, areas that you want covered as part of a discussion. <coughs> Representative Corman. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's, um, I'm probably not going to be taking the van. So if it's a, a, a question of do we need a larger van because I'm going to be there, probably I won't be in, in the van driving separately. Uh, the one thing I'd really be curious to see, it's not so much um, the hardware, but I'd, I'd be curious to see them actually conduct an auction. Representative Thomas. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in hearing about any nuclear oversight that they may be doing. Thank you. Representative Lewicki. Uh, thank you. Um, depending on conditions with the van, it may be better for me to go separately because I'm already salt and uh, it might be, you know, if the van's going to be packed, then it'd be easier if I do go separately. Representative McGee concurs with that. Um, Vice Chair Thomas. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> at the risk of opening up a can of worms, um, in, in, the, in the past, if you have specific questions uh, of ISO New England, in the past, they have asked us to forward those questions to them as soon as possible so that they can address them either once they're there or experience shows that sometimes it takes them a lot longer to respond to those questions. But in, in either case, if you have a specific question, I would suggest maybe you uh, funnel it to uh, Representative Bernardi and maybe we can get with um, their contact point and forward them saying, here's things that we're interested in and just see what they say. But that's that would but that would be that would be the best way to handle it prior to waiting you know before just waiting until we got there so that might be helpful so just to recap on those who may not take the van representatives corman mcgee lewicki and wendy thomas and Parsh. you're going down route three right we're going to Holyoke, Mass. However, he gets there. <laughs> well, if you're going to do that, then then I'll take the van. Okay. Maybe you could uh, circulate as soon as you find out where where the van is going. Yeah. Let people know so that people could decide yes or no on the van. Yeah. All right. And what day is this trip again? 12 March. 12 March. Isn't that town meeting day? Yes, it is. Hmm. That's going to be a problem for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, <clears throat> it is what it is, right? 
So, so given the, th the length of that trip, I'd say it's going to be a pretty early morning start, like 8 a.m., and probably not returning to the LLB till 5 a.m., or 5 p.m. <laughs> well, that's true. That's why I, I indicated that doing it on the 12th. <clears throat> Do you want to consider investigating another date? Um, I, I can do that. I can I can check see whether another date's possible. Okay. Has it already has it already been noticed in the calendar? No, it has okay. not been noticed in the calendar. I just I just asked that it be noticed this morning, so it hasn't happened yet. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so. The basic issue here is that this trip is being planned. <laughs> the planning is not maybe complete yet. So we will continue to work on that. Just uh, pay attention to Rep Representative Bernardi's emails if you have any intention on going on this trip. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Thomas, do you have any other information about any upcoming presentations or anything uh only that we're working uh for presentations or i should say representative bernardi will be working with for presentations with uh, department of energy and department and department of environmental services uh, those are the only two things that we currently are are looking at right now i suggest we get this iso thing out of the way first hmm. idea. okay all right Anything else on this subject? All right, let's get to work then on our full committee work session. We're gonna talk about three bills this morning. House Bill 1644FN, requiring the Department of Energy to initiate an investigation of the benefits and key considerations regarding support for clean or non-carbon emitting power generation. HB 1465, relative to studies of nuclear energy technologies and HB 1431, relative to utility requirements for integrated distribution planning. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Over here. Representative Munns. Could I, could I ask that we, um, that we put HB 1465 to the end of the list because uh, there's an amendment that should be available within the next half hour, 45 minutes? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Not a problem. But we will start with HB 1644 FN, and I am passing out right at this moment. Amendment 2024-0610H. Now, you will recall when I introduced this bill originally, I had informed the committee that the, the original version of the bill was to convert our renewable portfolio standard into a zero emission portfolio standard. And I actually had the language drafted and it added nuclear to the RPS. And then I abandoned that draft because it couldn't make it work financially and went with the draft that was subsequently filed as the bill as introduced. Since that time, the Connecticut legislature has added RPS to its, I mean, added nuclear to its RPS using language that's virtually identical to what I've uh, proposed in this amendment to HB 1644. So this amendment would replace the entire bill and change the name of the bill so that after September 1st of 2024, any newly built nuclear power generating facility that commenced operation would be eligible for class one RECs. Now what this bill does is it hangs out a sign that says New Hampshire is open for business when it comes to nuclear energy. Obviously, there are no nuclear power plants currently being proposed or built 
in New Hampshire. So this would not affect the RPS at any point in the foreseeable future. But what it would do is it would send a signal that should somebody decide that maybe New Hampshire is a good place to build a nuclear facility, that the state is open to supporting it. So that's why I'm proposing this amendment. It's a fairly simple amendment, as you can see, and I'm interested in your reactions to it. Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it's well-intentioned. Um, my concern off just, uh, you know, off the cuff in reviewing it when we received it yesterday was that um, this hasn't been uh, an addition to a class, which is uh, new renewable, right, class one. Um, it hasn't been studied in terms of economic impact. To your point, there wouldn't be an immediate inter impact, but you would also be setting up um, multiple classes of nuclear, right? So there would be an advantage to any new nuclear plants and, you know, the existing nuclear plant would be playing on a different playing field, uh, as would all the other renewable generation. So I think it's something that really has to be studied before we put it into law um, and say that we can pronounce a solution based on what another state has arrived at without us really understanding the impact um, economically, basically, on our energy sources generators. Okay, thank you. Further discussion? Vice Chair Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I like the amendment. I, I think it does exactly what the chair uh, says uh, it's supposed to do. Um, true, if and when um, someone ever became interested in coming to New Hampshire, uh, I think at that time we could easily um, submit something else that could say uh, we, we need to maybe study something uh, that would um, uh, to make sure that we've had all the uh, T's crossed, I's dotted. But I think to get us off the board right now, I think this is a good amendment. If we want to come back next year with something to add to it, we perhaps could do it then. Further discussion? Representative Corman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with, with uh, placing nuclear power as a renewable source. Um, I don't view it really as renewable. It requires a fuel that is, is mined and processed. It, I, I don't see it as renewable. Um, I also have a slight concern about the amount of power that nuclear can produce swamping some of the things that we do consider renewable in that class. Um, and I'm not against nuclear, but I, I, I do have a, a small concern about that. Um, I recognize that most likely any nuclear facility that, uh, that arises in New Hampshire will probably be much smaller scale than what we have now. Uh, so I'm, I, I don't know how well-founded that concern is but I wonder if it might make sense to, to try to put some cap on the size of a nuclear facility uh, that, that would actually get the wrecks. So you might be suggesting that small nuclear, or small modular reactors uh, might be appropriate, but a large reactor might not? That, that's right. And, and I don't really think we're going to see any new large reactors, but I don't know. Correct. Representative Lewicki. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there is an issue with small nuclear plants of uh, essentially uh, uh, scale. Basically, there's a lot of overhead that you're going to need. You're going to need a whole different kind of security and so forth on a nuclear plant than you would on a uh, fossil fuel plant or many other things. And so, you know, there may be a, a real issue if, uh, you know, if, for instance, the you know, if you had a 100 megawatt nuclear plant, it wouldn't be worth building because of those uh, overhead issues. Representative Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to add um, my, I have a similar concern as my colleague 
um, Representative Corman, with defining nuclear energy as renewable. Um, I don't agree that it's renewable. Uh, so, however, I'm not anti-nuclear. I, um, you know, am I'm open and looking looking forward to the emergence of uh, small nuclear reactor technology uh, as a potential answer to the climate problem. Um, but I would be, I'm essentially supportive of, of your effort here. Um, if, if perhaps we made it a separate, uh, somehow I know it's called the Renewable Portfolio Standard, but um, some way distinguishing it from, I'm, I'm opposed to applying the label renewable to nuclear. Representative Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I just had uh, maybe two comments. One is, you know, when we talk about renewable, um, we have to keep in mind that solar panels and wind turbines do not last forever. They break down, they turn into junk, you know, after about 25 or 30 years, and they have to be scrapped and new ones have to be built. The second thing is um, the fuel requirements for nuclear reactors is extremely low. It almost doesn't add any cost to the electricity. It's a capital cost and, and the workforce that maintain the plant. You know, that's where most of the costs come from. Uh, and the, the second comment I had is since we started to talk about small modular reactors, um, I thought I'd promote my favorite right now. Um, I, I was always a fan of General Electric's economic simplified boiling water reactor. I thought that was maybe the best design in the world. Um, it's never been built. But recently, General Electric um, decided to get on the SMR bandwagon, and they have a scaled-down version of the boiling water reactor. It's the B uh, R W no, boiling <laughs> PWRX 300. So it's a 300 megawatt electric output reactor. Um, you know, and a side thing, we talked about Bo a little bit, you know, you know, I don't know how we would make the politics and economics work, but if you wanted to drop in, as that bill said, a clean, reliable source of electricity, you know, that wouldn't be a bad thing. And the last comment I would make is that uh, right now, General Electric has a contract to build, I think, two of these at Darlington. Um, another aside, I used to swim at the Darlington Beach in the coolant water, basically. Um, but anyway, so this, is, this has gotten past the point of, you know, unicorns and, and whatnot. So, you know, they're going to build one. And Saskatchewan is also, you know, in kind of late discussions on, uh, you know, building one of these reactors. So those are just two comments uh, relative to what we're talking about. Thank you. Vice Chair Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I understand what some of our concerns are here with this amendment, and perhaps there might be room to make an adjustment, um, perhaps um, before we exec this bill. But I would appeal to the committee members that we need to start telling people through our actions that clean energy, nuclear, is going to be very important in, in the future as we uh, gravitate to more of the renewables, whatever class we want to call it in. And I think this amendment would show people, they will begin to see that we are gravitating towards, uh, at least entertaining the idea of, of having nuclear back in the state at some time in the future, if it ever comes. But more importantly, it will tell industries that at least we're open, as the chair has said. I think this bill, this, this amendment, I think would be key to putting that forward into the future. So however way we can maybe arrange this so that we can get this through committee, I think would be very important for a message and further work, I'm sure, I'm positive, would be done at, at the Senate level. So um, I believe this amendment is very important. If we can do some tweaks with it to get it through here, that's fine. But I, um, uh, but I think it's important that we get this through in some manner. Representative Harrington? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, I think we shouldn't get too excited one way or the other about this bill because no one's going to be building a nuclear plant in New Hampshire in at least 10 years, if even then. As, as I've said before, uh, 
we're not a vertically integrated state, and in most plans looking at that are vertically integrated states where the rate payers would take some of the risk of building a nuclear plant. We also have a history of anti-nuclear activism in this, in this state. So uh, when I hear the head of nuclear at Duke Energy say they're going to wait five to ten years because they don't want to be first, and they have a huge fleet of nuclear plants with nuclear expertise and an vertically integrated state and in a state that's states that have said they like nuclear power. I just don't see it happening here. So let's not get too excited about it. If we were to do it, to put it out there to say, yeah, we're, we're interested in nuclear. If you want to think about it, it does no harm. And I wouldn't be concerned about it being mixed up with renewable and non-renewable because effectively it's not going to do anything. And if 10 years or 15 years from now, something had to be adjusted, we could adjust it then. But I think basically now it's just a sign saying, hey, we're interested in nuclear. Other states have been doing certain things. Uh, I think it was Illinois uh, passed a bill that said uh, they got rid of their prohibition on nuclear, new nuclear power plants. And of course, Connecticut doing this. And there's been a few other states doing the same thing. So I, I just, I, I wouldn't get too hung up on it, but uh, it doesn't do any harm. Representative Partial. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in response to earlier comments about uh, the non-renewability of solar and wind, what we're talking about is not the energy there. We're talking about the devices that we use to collect those on that energy. And for that matter, nuclear has an even more severe problem in that we really have not totally solved what we're doing with the waste. So uh, that's one of my concerns, to characterize this as being you know, solar doesn't work because panels wear out. Nuclear doesn't work because plants wear out. Uh, also, I'm thinking, I, I, I also wholeheartedly agree with uh, Representative Harrington um, and that this is not something on the horizon. And I think that we have lots of time to get our sign hung out for New Hampshire if we see this is the direction we're going. And lastly, I know there are several concerns about lithium mining and the conditions that, um, upon which lithium is mined. And I'm thinking that cobalt mining, which has been going a lot longer, is not that much better. It uses the same, comes from the same parts of the uh, planet, such as the Congo, and uh, it uses the same labor force, which is questionable. There, that's the issues that I have right now. Thank you. Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a comment on uh, on the renewability concept or and the f uh, of fuel uh, for power plants, um, nuclear plants. Uh, one of the advantages of uh, the small scale fast flux reactors is they can use a reprocessed fuel from one of the large thermal reactors as a potential fuel source. So the concern of, of uh, what do we do with the long-term waste of a large thermal plant can be remediated by using that as the fuel source in a fast flux reactor. Uh, that, although not a renewable, it certainly is a recyclable resource. Representative Kaplan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said here. I think nuclear has potential and, and we should not uh, shun it, you know, instinctively because of our fears uh, of, uh, the, you know, past technologies that are being improved. Um, however, I, I do uh, agree with Representative Harrington and Representative Parshall that, you know, we are in no hurry and that why are we intent on sending a signal which at best is problematic because uh, of the possible distortions in, in the, in, in, to, the, to the renewable energy portfolio, renewable portfolio standard program. I, I think that those possible distortions are fairly obvious given the different uh, sorts of technology involved as Representative Corman pointed out. Uh, so why would we send a, a flawed signal like that um, when there's no hurry? Well, in response to you, Representative Kaplan, and I appreciate those comments, I would say, I would argue that there, we are in a hurry. If it's gonna take 10 or more years to get one of these plants built, we have to send a signal that it's time to start working on that now. And we have a serious reliability problem that we're facing, particularly in the New England region. It's, it's a countrywide problem, but it's even more acute here 
than it is anywhere else. And I think time is short to find a solution to keeping our lights on going forward. And if we can indicate that we're, as a state, open and encouraging of the development of nuclear power, I think we need to send that message and send it sooner rather than later. Who's next? Representative Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have two points. One is on the current uh, discussion that's going on where you said that this sends a message, quote, New Hampshire is open for business. Um, <clears throat> that to me ring rings all kinds of bells. I mean, so we're not we haven't studied this. We haven't set up any kind of guardrails, and we're saying, come and build your nuclear plants in New Hampshire. I think that that's really problematic. Um, number two is that this bill has a fiscal note attached to it. So does this amendment alter that fiscal note in any way? Yes, it eliminates it, invalidates it, I should say. Thank you. Representative Munns. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and um, just to acknowledge what you had said when you introduced the amendment, I did go on the um, state of Connecticut's website and, um, you know, the, 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 that act did, was passed and uh, it was, nuclear was added to the class one renewable standard as of October 1st of 2023. Um, but to um, follow up on Representative Corman and Reynolds' point, um, the one thing that I did notice is that in Connecticut, <clears throat> the class one um, percentage target um, after 2030 is 40% compared to New Hampshire's 15%. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering whether, you know, if we were to pass this, whether that, sh that we should also adjust the, the renewable portfolio standards um, for class one to reflect the fact that you're, you, we would be introducing this new technology that could end up producing a, a significant amount of power. A legitimate concern. And one of the reasons why we referred for interim study, a bill that we heard earlier this year, filed by Representative Harrington, to consider the future of the RPS Right now, the way the statute is written, after 2025, there is no projection of what the future of the RPS might look like. And that is something that we need to consider going forward. But I don't think we should wait to indicate to the world that we think nuclear is important. Representative Lewicki. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're all over the map here, and I figure this might be an appropriate point time to be, go further afield. But one of the things, <laughs> uh, one of the issues is uh, thorium. Basically, in my mind, thorium, they say it's radioactive, but in reality, I think it's just fissionable, and there's effectively an infinite amount of that. And the daughter product is, I believe, an isotope, uh, an inner isotope of lead rather than uh, being radioactive itself. So it it's, you know, one thing I hope somebody's working on. Uh, Vice Chair Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can I have, can I ask the, the Department of Energy a question? Sure. If the department is willing to answer. It's a short question. Mr. Roberge, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Griffin yes. Roberge, uh, Department of Energy. You know who I am. Sorry. Uh, in 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 um, reference to the uh, the concern posed by uh, uh, Representative Thomas earlier, if this bill were to pass this year, could there be a nuclear plant built in the next year or the year after, or even within three years, just by coming in here and starting it? Sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'd say that's a hypothetical. I guess I'm not sure, but developing nuclear resources certainly does take time. Um, so I'm not aware of any specific plans to site any new 
nuclear resources in the state in the next year or two or three. And and a follow, follow up. up. And so therefore, through uh, licensing processes and 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 so forth, there would be uh, quite a bit of a time lag there, where during that time period, uh, certain things could could be studied before they even even thought about starting here. Would that would that be your assessment? That's correct. Yes. Thank you. Representative McGee, do you have a question for? No. Okay. No, I don't believe Anybody so. have a question for Mr. Roberge? No. Representative Kaplan. Yeah, I mean, th thank you, Mr. Roberge, for uh, taking my question. What, do you have, can you foresee any potential impacts of adding new nuclear technology to the renewable portfolio standards on uh, the other renewable energy uh, sources getting renewable energy credits? Sure. Um, you know, obviously, I you know, the a lot of these questions are hypotheticals. I can't predict what would happen, but you know, um, nuclear resources do produce quite a bit of generation. Obviously, depending on the size of anything that's produced in the future, um, you know, there is the potential um, there for new resources coming in to crowd out other resources within Class One. Any other questions for Mr. Roberge? Representative Partial. I'm getting drawn in. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Thanks. I could say how how about those chiefs, but uh, <laughs> I won't go there. Um, how will this? How do you foresee this affecting our current rec market uh, with our current use of uh, the Seabrook? Basically, will this have any uh, positive or ne negative impact upon the? maintenance of that plant sure and thank you for the question so based on the language that you know i'm, I'm really just seeing um you know this is this would allow new nuclear power generating facilities that became operational after september 1 of 2024 um i do not anticipate seabrook would be able to take part in this um under this in, take part in the rps under this amendment as it is an existing generation facility you have a question for Mr. Robers? I do. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Robers, for taking my question. Good morning. Um, so my question is how much RECs actually um, go for at this point. In other words, if we had, you know, a 300 megawatt plant that ended up having output capacity that dwarfs all other renewables that are in the that new category, um, they would likely be taking most of, if not all of the RECs, but I, I, I'm curious how much of an incentive it actually is, because I don't think the RECs in this state are very valuable at this point. So I'd like to know what a REC is worth at this point. Sure, and thank you for the question. So, What's, And how many of them are in circulation? Because I don't think we know that either. Sure, so some of that information is in an annual report um, that we kick out every year. Um, if it's helpful, I can find the page and forward it along after. Um, after. Um, I'd have to talk internally as to what the current kind of going price is for class one recs. Um, it's not something I, oh, oh <laughs> so, sorry. Um, I don't know off the top of my head that's something I need to dig a little bit deeper in and follow up with the committee by an email, if that's all right. And follow up, um, and how many are there? Like, how does that get determined? Because I know it's in the reporting, but I don't think we know it off the top of our heads. And so. I don't either. <laughs> so, But I, I know that that number is in the report and I can find that number and follow up with the committee. Thank you. You have a question for Mr. Roberge or, or another comment? Okay, Representative Thomas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Roberge, can you tell us what are the guardrails for any new nuclear builds? And is that under your office or is it under DES? And what's to keep a new nuclear plant from becoming the new St. Cobain of New Hampshire? Sure. So thank you for the question. So for any new nuclear facility, there are, there are a number of permits that I imagine that facility might need, such as, say, uh, going through DES permitting, National uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that type of thing. I'm certainly not an expert on every single permit that um, such a resource would need. Um, yeah, it, again, it, it, it is kind of a hypothetical. I can't predict what the future might hold. Um, but I imagine, yes, permitting will be required for any type of permit that comes on in the future. Thank you. Representative Kennedy, question for Roberge or not? Okay. Okay. 
Representative Harrington, a question for Mr. Rober. Well, actually, more of a follow-up to his question. As far as the permitting goes, it's exclusive purview of the NRC to license uh, nuclear plants in the United States. It's it's completely federal. But there are various permits that are involved from the state. DES would be involved if there was a water discharge permit, for example. Uh, usually there's a coolant system involved. They'd be involved in that. If there was any air emissions, a lot of these plants have a diesel generator, emergency diesel generator associated with it. Um, and also they may even have something else to uh, what they use to start up that would involve uh, air discharge. So there are some state permits, but the biggest one is going to be the NRC. First, the design has to be licensed uh, by the NRC, and then there's a specific license that would have to be granted for the construction and operation of a plant by the NRC again, and that takes multiple years to get. All right, I'm going to cut it off there and let you go because... I think we need to wrap up this discussion here pretty quickly. We've got two other bills that we need. Work session. I was trying to get a comment in before. You okay. Get what is your quick comment, please? Yep. So I just wanted to uh, mention we, we've discussed a number of different nuclear technologies. I read an article this weekend on um, the viability of pulling uranium from the ocean, which is would be would make nuclear renewable. So they are working on that. But... In its current state, the types of reactors that are currently allowed by the NRC for permitting are not considered renewable. And so although Connecticut has gone this way, and I don't know what their decision making was, I still think, for my point that I made with Mr. Roberge, um, Rex would not be a significant incentive for something as expensive as bringing in a nuclear reactor, right? That it would be the offset to the kind of cost that would be involved would be very minimal. So I don't think that this is the nod to say that we're um, in, look interested in nuclear. I don't think that this is going to assist in any way, but it will redefine what we interpret to be renewable in the state. And I, and I don't think that that's a good idea, and I don't think that it will be helpful to the RPS. So I would like to recommend that we either IS this or we ITL this and we let um, Representative Harrington's bill for interim study on where the RPS is moving be a place where we have this discussion because I don't think the bill is ready to become law. That's just, that's how I see it. Thank you. Did you have one more comment, Representative Kennedy? I see your hand up. Uh, I would have a many comments about the Twin Cities. All right, so you don't, okay. You're gonna, you're gonna stand <laughs> down. All right, let's move on then and, uh, <clears throat> have a discussion about HB 1431. We have a couple of amendments for that. Representative Kaplan has an amendment. Let's talk about his amendment first. Um, the amendment. So uh, what I'm passing out now, Mr. Chair, is a slight modification on my original amendment. So it's uh, basically cleaning it up a little bit. So are you passing out 0609H? I believe so, yeah. So what I'm passing out is 0609H. Okay. I also have 20 copies of it here. I don't know why I have all these copies. All right, okay. If anybody out there would like a copy of this amendment, we have lots up here, so please come get one. For a very reasonable price. And if you act now... So, I mean, I, I'd like to go through the changes on this uh, you. amendment from the original amendment, which I shared at the public hearing. So there's basically three changes on this new amendment. And the first one is that uh, the word transmission has been taken out. Okay, so everywhere the, the word transmission <laughs> occurred in the original amendment is, is now just reads distribution okay so we're just talking about distribution lines not transmission lines because the feedback in the public hearing was pretty consistent that transmission lines are a federal prerogative and don't belong in the PUC's domain so took out transmission line uh, transmission lines from the equation the second change that occurs is on page 2 line 36 and it's in, it's talking about the enforceability mechanism of this 
integrated plan bill. <clears throat> and uh, I added the word distribution on line 36. So it says, it reads now, no distribution rate change shall be approved uh, in the case where there's no plan on file. So we, we heard feedback from Mr. Franz that that would be a red flag if, uh, if the default rate cases were impacted by, by this mechanism. So took out the default rate cases from the equation and now it's just distribution rate changes that, was, that uh, can, cannot be approved if there's no plan on file. Okay, that's it. No, there's one, there's one more change and that is on uh, page, the first page. Line 30, line uh, 26, sorry. <clears throat> I've added in at the behest of the Community Power Coalition people, uh, added in competitive choice of electricity suppliers consistent with RSA 374F uh, as uh, into the list of things that need to be included in the plan. So that's, that's offering the option of considering the growth of community power and the impact that that would have on, on their planning, on the planning of the utilities. So those are the three main changes in this amendment. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, but that, the, the original amendment also added gas, so that still that still is in here. That, that gas lines, or the gas utilities are included. Can you please go over the first? Okay. Change. Thank you, uh, Representative Kaplan. Questions, Representative Thomas. Yes. Can you just clarify that the first change that you mentioned regarding transmission? Yeah. Okay. Well, on the original amendment. Uh, there, every time there was the word distribution, there also occurred and transmission. So now the word transmission has been taken out. You won't see that in this amendment. Okay. So, for instance, on line 15, submission of integrated electric distribution plans to the commission. Originally that read distribution and transmission plans. Okay. So we've taken out transmission plans from the equation. Additional questions for Representative Kaplan. Representative McGee. I didn't have a question um, for Representative Kaplan. I, I wanted to just provide a little bit of context as well because um, this amendment is trying to address language that was removed uh, last session when we passed HB 281. And that was the least cost integrated resource planning statute. At the time of the Senate hearing, um, we were looking at a sort of an omnibus bill with five different bills that were pulled together. One of those sections was to repeal um, the least cost integrated resource planning. And at that time, um, a discussion was had that the definition um, of New Hampshire energy policy, which appears under 378.37, uh, was not something that we wanted to repeal with everything else, and it, it would have in its state. So we, the bill was amended to ensure that that language, which appears in this amendment from line 9 to line 14, um, with, I guess there were some modifications in there. I don't know. You could probably speak to that. They were in the original amendment. You had, you had changed that, updated that language. But what it does is um, it preserves what we were discussing in those hearings in terms of the energy policy statement uh, that's been on the books for a long time. And so uh, this particular amendment um, goes further in that it takes the other subsections which were eliminated altogether and brings back the language that actually requires uh, our regulators to be looking at uh, long-term planning and integrated planning, which is probably more important than ever, because as the system is changing and getting more complex, um, you know, it's really important that the regulators understand what the utilities are doing and that the utilities be able to explain how they're keeping costs low for people. So even though it's not called a least cost integrated resource planning statute anymore, it is still uh, the way it's written here, uh, devoted to the idea of, of pushing least cost or, or cost impacts need to be addressed in those, in those uh, proceedings. So I just wanted to put some context around why the bill, where the bill came from, and um, for your consideration. <laughs> That's all. 
Okay, further discussion. Now, I know that during the public hearing on this bill, there was some mention that gas utility regulation is not under the control of the PUC, and it may not be appropriate in this legislation. Does anybody recall that? I, I don't recall those comments being made, Mr. Chair, to be honest. Yeah. Was it just transmission? Yeah, the transmission was an issue. Okay. Correct. Yeah, All right. I don't have my notes yeah, right in front utility. of me, unfortunately. All right, further discussion. Representative Harrington. Yeah, I had a couple of questions on the on the bill. Um, it seems to be, well, let me just read it. Now. Um, if you go to uh, line 12, it talks about uh, various things that the state's utilities were providing for. It says the use of cost-effective energy efficiency and other demand-side resources, protection of the safe, uh, safety and health of the citizens, and finally, physical environment of the state and the future supplies of resources. Well, the first thing I guess I'd comment on there, it, there's nothing about cost-effectiveness as far as rates go. It just talks about cost-effective, use of cost-effective energy efficiency. Um, I don't know what the future supplies of resources implies, but later on, when you go down to line 18, it does talk about necessary to improve cost effectiveness. So could you clarify that? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, thank you for the, thank you for the comment, Representative Harrington. I think when it comes to the cost effectiveness in, in the, uh, energy policy definition on, you know, three, 378 colon 37, uh, that when you look at the language around financial stability of the state's utilities you know the whole the whole mechanism of, of the of the rate changes is to guarantee the financial stability of the utilities and that is included pretty much up front as a first principle okay so it is included in there reasonable and fair electric and gas rates that consider the financial stability of the state's utilities i i, I find that a pretty clear statement of the need to take care of the utilities and their business model, including the rate case. Any more questions? What follow up? Go ahead. What, what is the future supplies of resources imply at the very last uh, part of line four? Yeah, I mean, you, you don't have a clear picture of that, neither do I, because it's in the future. Um, but I think that has to do, you know, the way I read that, it has to do with diversity of, of, uh, of energy resources to try to minimize risk going forward. And so that's how I read it anyways. Future supplies of resources means we need to think about the future and what resources are in the basket of resources that we have at the moment and, you know, how that's going to look going forward. So when you saw resources, you're talking about uh, generation and uh, demand reduction? Yeah. I mean, okay. So yeah. – I'm, not, I'm just a little confused on that. The, you, so you're saying the utility then should plan going out to say, uh, if I go out for, for default service rates, I better make sure I don't get too much of X gen type of generation because maybe there won't be enough of that around in the future, but maybe I should get more of Y. I'm a little confused on what that implies. Well, I mean, it, it, we're talking about 10-year plans. So uh, default rate cases are usually more short-term than that. But... Um, so yeah, they need to look at what are the impacts of their programs and you know how that plays out on a 10-year scale. Uh, so if they are currently invested heavily in you know transmission and distribution line or distribution lines that are, are uh, appropriate for a certain technology and not for another technology, maybe they uh, you know look at what that what the implications of that are going forward. Does that help you? Not really, no. Further questions, comments, et cetera? Okay, seeing none, I guess we now have a understanding of Representative Kaplan's amendment. And I am now circulating an amendment of my own, which is amendment 0649H. And this amendment is different from Representative Kaplan's amendment 
in that it amends the original bill. His amendment 0609 amends a previous amendment, <laughs> right, Representative Kaplan? Yes. Right. So this, this amendment um, just amends the original bill. And it does so by rewriting sections 3, 4, and 5 that start on uh, line 23 of the original bill. And then on page two of the original bill, it changes on line eight, the number six to the number three, so that the text would read, the utility will have three months to amend and resubmit rather than six months. Those are the changes that my uh, amendment makes. The rewrite of uh, lines 23 through 30 of the original bill that are lines 3 through 8 of the amendment uh, essentially just uh, remove some language about grid modif modification uh, to make it clear that What we're looking for here is an assessment of distribution infrastructure necessary to ensure a reliable and resilient electric system capable of meeting the forecasted customer customer demand. So, uh, and then of course, the rewrite of section five on line 28 in the original bill now talks about an assessment of the plan's integration and consistency with the state energy strategy and removes references to environmental and economic uh, and price impacts so that um, those situations with the utilities and the public commission com, uh, utilities commission told us they don't have the wherewithal to assess what long and short term environmental and economic conditions are going to be so we took i put uh, took those out of the uh, amendment so that is uh, the amendment that i'm going to offer for hb 1431 and uh, enjoy, entertain your comments, Representative Munns. So this, um, so your amendment would would um, <clears throat> keep the bill as only addressing electric utilities, nothing for gas utilities. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Additional comments, Representative Thomas. Uh, yes, I just have tremendous concerns about removing um, the environment. Oh, excuse me, <coughs> the environmental impact. Um, I, I just think that's that's so dangerous, and we've seen instances already in New Hampshire where the environment has not been protected from corporations, and we've had massive problems. I think the uh, concern that was expressed during the public hearing was that if you open this up to environmental impacts, then these, uh, the adjudications, adjudic the deliberations on these plans would never end because the number of environmental impacts, long and short term, is virtually endless. And as a result of that, these plans would never get approved because the proceedings would drag on for potentially years while all these, while every environmental group in the world brought its concerns uh, to the commission about these, these plans. So it, it's, it's gonna make the bill and the, the legislation unworkable to leave that in there. I understand your concerns and I, I share them, but I don't think this is the right place to be addressing those concerns. Representative Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I um I agree with I agree with you on that. Uh, I think that if we are attempting to reinstate a reasonable um, process for our state's electric utilities to, you know, <clears throat> do this kind of planning, manage the evolution of the electric grid toward a more, um, you know, disaggregated uh, system, more decentralized sources of supply. Uh, I, um, I think we should keep it, we should limit it to that. And there are, I think that there are lots of, there are other, um, other venues and other, other permitting processes that, that would, uh, suffice to protect the environment. Um, you know, yeah, I just, I think, um, we should keep it tight. I like your, um, amendment where you're collapsing the timeline in required from you know letting these letting the planning drag on to a year rather um, make it um, shorter so that um, so that the, the process be stays meaningful and isn't you know just dragged out and interminable thank you additional comments representative McGee Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think I, I, I uh, could agree with removing maybe the plans long and short term, but I, I don't see us saying that any uh, forward reaching planning by the utilities should go in front of an adjudicative body, one of the only that it goes in front of, without any assessment of environmental, public health, economic, and energy price in impacts on the state because those are all the things that the people we work for care about, right? They care about whether their environment's going to be negatively impacted and their own health, and they care about the economics of what we're doing with energy and also the price impacts. And so if we remove that language, what we're saying is we'll just trust that all that's going to happen without us giving any, um, any guidance to the regulators in terms of the expectation that those plans will be looked at in that light. And so I think that's really important language. I think the other thing for consideration is that the additional language that is in the amendment that Representative Kaplan brought would be lost if we adopt this amendment. So all of the other um, efforts to restate how we would be approaching um, electric and utility, electric utility and natural gas utility integrated planning would not be covered so we would we would lose um language that i think is also very important for us to reinstate represent vice chair thomas uh, thank you mr chair i um so correct me if i'm wrong but uh wouldn't things such as environmental concerns be the subject of whatever citing process might be going on at, at the time should should something new uh, come up? I mean, uh, uh, there there must be other avenues we have in the state that handles environmental concerns um, b besides what was in here. So, I would think our normal process would cover that anyway. Representative Harrington. Yeah, just at first, I'd like to make sure I'm clear on what the bill is actually doing. So. You're going back, not to the amendment we received today, but to the original bill as introduced, correct? Say again? We, we're dealing with changes to the original bill as introduced. Correct. Okay. We have two okay. amendment proposals. So we're looking on here then, um, 378 colon 37 stays the same. There's no change to that. That stays the same as in the original bill? Yes. And then in 38, we change sections three, four, and five. Everything else stays the same. Correct? Correct. Okay. And then on the, the uh, last page of the bill as submitted, 39, we replace 39 completely with uh, a new 39. And 40 stays the same. Is that correct? 
No. The okay. amendment that I've proposed doesn't change anything in 39 except the number six. In the original bill, my amendment changes it to the number three. Other than that, I'm the language about, is you, the same. You, you say amend 378-39-1 as inserted by Section 2 of the bill by replacing it with the following. So you're replacing that whole, whole paragraph. Correct. But, you say but the, the only, only change is, is the number six, to three. six is changed to a three. Okay. okay. For the purposes of yeah. drafting, the uh, OLS attorney thought that replacing the whole paragraph okay. was the way to go okay. in order to change that. And then one section number. two and, and as well as three seventy eight forty remain as in the original bill. Correct. Okay. And one last question: Why was gas taken out since it's a right. regulated utility as well? I took out gas because. Uh, well, actually, I didn't take anything out. What I did is I amended the original bill, which did not have gas in it. So that's the explanation for, uh, ex explanation for that. Representative Munns. Um, and I apologize if I missed this in your, um, your introduction of the bill. Um, but in, um, in the original bill, lines t on page one, lines 23 through 25, which you are amending that the original bill includes says that such assessments, such assessments shall include consideration of the benefits and costs of grid modernization. You, you, you are deleting that. Can you, you kind of give us some background on why you are doing that? I think that uh, goes beyond the scope of what a distribution plan is all about. That is a subject that I think is beyond the scope of, of what one of these plans can do and would lead to protracted discussions that would delay the approval of the plan, just like environmental considerations. Follow up? But isn't the, gr but isn't the grid the distribution network? So why wouldn't... The grid is, but modernizing the grid is not something that a distribution plan is going to discuss. It would implement modernization re requests or, or requirements as they uh, are imposed. Representative Munns? Um, but this is, you know, this is another word for a strategic plan. And, you know, if if the grid is not going to meet the needs of the future, shouldn't that be included in a strategic plan? It could be, I suppose, but doesn't, I don't think it needs to be because it just opens a door that might take many, many months or years to close. Representative McGee. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that this distributed, integrated, distributed planning by the utilities, uh, the whole point, I think, is for them to be doing that planning and looking at that strategy or strategic, as, as Representative Munn said. So I'm wondering if we could have Mr. Lakata come up to speak to whether or not it's potentially burdensome to have grid modernization as something that they should at least be nodding to when they present these plans. Because I, I think it's appropriate. I don't know where else we would have it. And that was one of the discussions that came up when we decided to eliminate the least cost integrated resource planning language was that we needed some language that took the, the, the larger view rather than just, um, you know, uh, what you're putting in today, but basically tell us how this is going to play with uh, longer term thinking around the stability of the grid itself or the um, modernization of the grid. So I, I don't see where else those things would be taken into consideration. And if there's no dialogue between the regulators and the utilities on that, and no statutory requirement for there to be dialogue on that, then I think we, I think we lose something really essential. So could we, could we ask, um, since we have a rep of our largest utility here? Uh, yes, I will ask him in just a moment. But first, sure. I'd react to your, your comment by saying that it will never be discussed 
uh, in one of these resource plans because it's not defined. What is grid modernization? My understanding of grid modernization is it could be literally hundreds of different things. And without a definition and, a, and a, some specificity in this language about grid modernization, you're looking at an approval process for one of these plans that could take years. So I, I just don't see how you can do this without a definition of what grid modernization is, because it's a broad umbrella term that means hundreds of different things. So Repre Mr. Lakata, uh, to uh, allow Representative McGee to ask you a question, could you please come forward? Representative Harrington. Yeah, I, I think we had a group, didn't we establish a group, an advisory group on grid modernization by statute last year? Well, that I thought that yes, we did. So we do have a, an active group working on this. So it's not like we're, we're just ignoring it. Just wanted people to realize that. Correct. Representative McGee. Thank you. <laughs> yes, so uh, to get back to grid modernization, I think is fairly well established, at least in the utilities community. <clears throat> um, and so, Mr. Licata, uh if you could tell us whether having the term grid modernization as it appears in the bill as originally written is in any way burdensome in terms of um, when you present a plan. Uh, I mean, grid modernization could be updating technology, different types of meters, could be, um, you know, uh, interconnection points. It could be, it could be many different things. But um, does having an overall term that creates a bucket for consideration, does that create a burden for the utilities or is it something you already do? <laughs> sure. I, I, um... I think Representative Harrington appropriately pointed out that um, last year the legislature had passed uh, uh, legislation creating a, a grid modernization advisory committee, and that actually is the reference to statute uh, that that's in the bill. Um, in terms of, so I I, I agree with um, Representative Harrington's point that there is a venue for conversations around grid modernization uh, at the state level. And quite frankly, the the output of that committee would be informing um, some of the work that the committees would that the utilities would do as part of this this long term planning. I, I don't think that it is um, necessary to have grid modernization as it's uh, in the bill called out in order for the utilities to capture um, you know, work that they're doing in this area. I, I do agree with Representative Vos that um, you know, the term grid modernization, although it is uh, linked back to statute here, can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, even within the utility space. Um, one might look at that from a metering perspective. One might look at it from smart switches. So there's there is a lot there, and I am um, sensitive to the concerns raised by uh, some of the committee members and the DOE of protracted um, uh, proceedings. I, I would point out um, just maybe to hopefully assuage folks' concerns on that. Uh, later in the bill, it does require the PUC render a decision either to approve or deny a plan within 12 months. So we don't want protracted, you know, lengthy proceedings that go on on forever as well as I don't think the DOE and commission would either. So so there is sort of a, a backstop on the end here to, to keep it from becoming a um, sort of a fishing expedition. But um, I, I think that you know, quite frankly, the removal of that language um, is is not harmful to the bill. It's not harmful to utility planning. And if it, you know, assuages some concerns with the bill about that protracted um, uh, efforts, I, I think it's worthy of removal. Follow up. Thank you. So was this language part of the original LCIRP? No. It was not. So no. grid modernization was not included in the strategic planning, basically, that we had in place before. Correct. So it's the, a new thing. That, that's, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. That helps. Welcome. All right. Thank you. 
Representative Munz, you have a question for Mr. Licata? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, our um, um, interconnects to EV charging stations, is that considered distribution? Yes, that's that's done at the distribution level. But that's that would be that would be part of the distribution network, and that would be included in a a a um, integrated distribution planning so, so process. Yeah, the short answer is is yes. And um, as I, I previously testified, we would be happy. I know there was a discussion about presentations in the future. Um, to the committee. And again, I'd be happy to have our planning folks come out and talk about the work that they do and, and how they do it. Um, in terms of a 10 year forecast, which is what we're talking about here, they look at, at sort of industry and population and, and economic trends. So there is data that they would access independent um, forecasts on, say, electric vehicle growth charging stations required to accommodate that, where those charging stations might be located, say the 93 corridor, you know, if, if there's, um, you know, a desire to, to support the tourism industry and, you know, have those folks come up from Massachusetts. So that's done at a sort of a high level planning uh, perspective, but we don't start building until, you know, we get an actual customer request. We do an assessment of that. We, we do an evaluation of the impact um, of that interconnection, just like we would with a, a, a PV station, PV installation. And there are costs associated with that installation that are borne by the developer seeking um, that interconnection. So I, I hope that helps. Follow up. Follow up. No, that makes perfect sense to me. I guess what I what I was trying to get at was, you know, we're, we've been talking about, you know, language and definitions and um you know we can't include the term grid modernization because that has all sorts of different connotations i just wanted to make sure that if we say distribution that you know a two years from now or whatever when we see a plan and it doesn't address interconnect somebody says well no that's not part of the distribution system so that that was yeah, my no question. no uh, understood and, and um whether it's it's positive growth from increased economic activity, um, customers choosing different options for either heating or or transportation, uh, or uh, on the other end of the scale, um, investments in energy efficiency or economic downturns, whatever it might be that that depress uh, growth uh, load, that would be contained within um, the first assessment, which is. Um, you know, a comprehensive forecast of the 10 year energy uh, demand. And that's that's something that, you know, the commission can, we'll say, look under the hood and, and question those assumptions uh, and say, well, hold on a second. You know, why are you assuming this? Shouldn't you be considering that? And and just to point out that, you know, one of the reasons we're supportive of this is, um, you know, both from a, a utility perspective, but I would say also from the customer perspective as well. Um, absent this uh, uh, regulatory framework that allows the commission and the Department of Energy and consumer advocate to to see those assumptions, the next time that they're going to have an opportunity to to essentially see our growth plans and how we're we're meeting them is during a rate case after we have built that infrastructure. And from a customer perspective, you know, I, I can't speak to any regulators in the room, but I know we have a former one sitting up at the table. Um, you know, once the utility has built something and is seeking cost recovery, it becomes harder for, for a disallowance at that point, as opposed to if we come in earlier, there's more opportunity for the regulator to push back on it because there isn't the financial detriment um, to the utility. So it allows for that earlier sort of realignment with the commission before money is spent, which ultimately is, is I think, good for the customer as well as, as the utility, obviously. But it, it, it is a form of, I, I would say, ratepayer protection. OK, great. Thanks. We don't need you to repeat your testimony from your from the original bill. Uh, 
Representative Corman. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Licata, earlier we were discussing um, a, uh, an item that would be omitted in Representative Vose's amendment, and it was the line that says, an assessment of the plan's long and short-term environmental, economic, and energy price impact on the state. And that's in, in the bill as introduced. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you can comment on, on those, I guess, three items here. Uh, whether Eversource has a, uh, an opinion on, on including environmental, economic, and energy price impact in the plan. Sure. Uh, so I, I think it's very important to remember what we're talking about with these plans. The distribution uh, utilities, Eversource, Unitil, and... Um, the electric co-op, although they're not subject to this, and, and Liberty, we're talking about poles, wires, transformers, smart switches. Um, so when you're looking at the environmental impacts of this plan, we're really talking about that street level infrastructure. And so, you know, this isn't power plants, this isn't you know, the utility making determinations about shutting down a, a gas plant or, or um, you know, really supply concerns there. So we have to comply with all the state uh, environmental laws and obviously all the federal environmental laws when we are building our infrastructure. We have to go get wetland permits, alteration of terrain permits, um, you know, uh, the whole gambit. And so I, I do agree with the comment that was previously said that there are many other, I think it was Representative Reynolds, there are many other venues for environmental considerations of utility infrastructure. And if we were to propose a significant pro pro um, project, um, that would be subject to the Site Evaluation Committee review process. Um, so so just to you know maybe put that into context in terms of the economic and energy price impact um quite frankly this is what the public utilities commission does that's the the purpose uh, of the commission is to weigh the interest of of customers and, and the utility through through an economic lens and so you know removing that i don't think weakens this i don't think it weakens the review the the puc is going to have cost uh front and center on this and i think uh, i would also point out you know at the end of the day they need to find that that our rates that our decisions are just reasonable and in the public interest so so I, I am not concerned with the removal of that again if it uh addresses concerns that that folks have um then then i think it's it's worth removal Okay, thanks a lot, Mr. Licata. I appreciate it. We're going to have to move on and talk about 1465 for a few minutes before we uh, shut down this full committee work session. Obviously, during the exec session, we can have further discussions, but Representative Munns, I'd like you to pass out your amendment to 1465 so that we can talk about this for a few minutes before we break for a caucus and then lunch. So please uh, start explaining the amendment while it's uh, moving around the table. Okay, um, I, um, I, I spoke with um, Representative Vose and Representative Harrington, and we also consulted with the, um, the Department of Energy, uh, as well as the prime sponsor on this bill, on this amendment. And um, I think I would characterize this amendment as just trying to to, to clean up some things and maybe clarify some things um, and hopefully not um, making too many significant um, policy changes. Um, the, the one thing that we did is uh, clarify that the um, uh, commissioner of, um, of uh, the Department of Energy is um, the the senior advisor as it relates to um, uh, nuclear uh, policy um, and in probably the most significant step we created a um, coordinator of nuclear development and regulatory activities um, to 
um, you know, oversee a lot of the uh, responsibilities that are now kind of now dispersed among different departments. Um, the responsibility of that coordinator would be to uh, that that coordinator would be the person that would be responsible for pulling together the report that's required in statute currently. Um, and they would be asking for input from the various departments. The way the bill is structured now is that each of those departments has to produce a report, and it seemed a little bit um, redundant. Um, the other thing that the, the amendment does is put the um, coordinator of nuclear development and um, regulatory activities, puts that position in the office of what is currently called the offshore wind industry develop the office of offshore wind industry development, um, and then the, what the amendment does is it renames that office the office of Inter energy Innov intervention, or innovation. Sorry, um, and um, to address concerns that um, the department and, um, and 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 others working on this had about the. The budget impact of doing all of this, what we have done is set the effective date for the bill or the amendment to be June 30th of 2025, which gives the um, department time to get a budget request in if they feel that there is additional costs, um, there is an opportunity to get money into the next budget, which would be proposed next January and would presumably be in effect by July 1st of 2025. So they, they would then have the resources that they need to implement this. Although it's not included in the, in, in the amendment, um, the discussions that we did have were that this Office of Energy Innovation would become the place where um, new and innovative energy um, solutions could be vetted, uh, analyzed. Um, we talked about, in addition to it, including offshore wind and nuclear, it could potentially be the place where all um, studies relating to hydrogen, battery storage, you know, other any other innovative um, technologies would be um, reviewed and um, and, and analyzed. So I think that's it. I don't know if Representative Harrington or Bose, you have anything you want to add? I do not, Representative Harrington. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, on the first page, line 26, it says the Public Utilities Commission. I don't see that they would have anything to do with uh, nuclear whatsoever. And also on line 28, talks about is the participation by public utilities subject to their jurisdiction again utilities don't make generation in New Hampshire so they wouldn't be involved in this um, the other question I have and I'm not sure the answer on this one uh, Department of Transportation talks about the transportation of special nuclear materials on the highways of the state I understand that's regulated by the federal government I don't know if the state gets involved we already do have that, that this is not a looking to the future thing we have special nuclear materials being moved because we refuel uh, at least we were refueling at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard um, so they have to they, I think the fuel comes in through New Hampshire even though it's in Maine and we also uh, refuel Seabrook so that would be special nuclear material I just don't know if there's any involvement there at all at this point, I, I know the feds regulate that quite extensively, but I don't know if the Department of Transportation maybe, has anything to do with it. Can I can I respond yeah. to that? Sure. Representative Munns. Yeah, the, the, the language that you see on page one, starting at line 19, all the way through the second page on line 10, I mean, that is language that already exists in statute. I just carried it forward. So, I mean, you may, you I, I'm not going to question... You know, whether, I mean, there may be some issues there. Um, you know, Department of Transportation, I'm assuming that that gets at exactly what you talked about. I mean, the transportation of nuclear material to the Kittery shipyard, the Kittery, uh, uh, the, uh, the Portsmouth Naval Yard and, and Seabrook. Um, 
but th that language that th that's existing language. There was no changes there. Yep, just copied it over. Exactly. So, Representative Munns, could you clarify for us that your amendment replaces uh, Section Two of the original bill? that appears on page two, starting at line five? Yeah, it, it replaces section two, uh, as you said, starting on page two, line five. Um, it also replaces section four, which starts on page two at line 22. And then it... Um, it changes section five with the language that's included in the amendment on page three, starting at line 19, that talks about, you know, the, the Office of Windshore Energy Development. Um, and um, I know that the sponsor was very concerned about um, advanced nuclear reactors so it 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 does not change paragraph three in the original bill that def that talks about that that's still in the bill but what I'm concerned about now looking at this is did it eliminate the new the definition of new advanced nuclear that's on in the original bill on page three. I don't think so. It uh, adds sections after section five of the bill, but it doesn't replace section. Okay. Five. Yep. Thank you. Thank. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it changes section two, it changes section four, and then it adds these these additional sections at the end that just do the housekeeping of changing the name of the Office of Energy of, of Offshore Wind to Energy Innovation. And that's all it does. It just changes the name. That's that there's nothing no increase in the scope or anything. Okay. Great. Representative Kaplan has a question or a comment. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I I need some clarification on uh, page four of the amendment. Is this new, uh, starting on line three, the, the establishment of a renewable energy fund? That's not in the original bill, is it? That's not in the original bill, and that is, that's not new. That's existing language. The only thing that's being done in that whole section, Roman numeral one there, is changing the name okay. um, on line 14. Okay, thank you. Representative Thomas has a comment or question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, two questions, clarification questions. First of all, um, we heard uh, some comment earlier that the NRC's purview covers nuclear facilities. So would this commission link arms with the NRC? Is there any mechanism for that? And my second question is the fiscal note. Does this um, amendment at all alter the fiscal note? Thank you. Uh, again, I mean, I, 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 I don't think it changes anything in terms of the state's relationship with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, really, all we're doing is establishing a, a, a position in the state to kind of coordinate all of that. So, if anything, it maybe it it makes it more efficient in terms of how the state interacts with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and then um, in terms of the. Um, fiscal note um, um, I, 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 I don't have the answer to that other than I'm assuming that since we're um, delaying the financial impact until you know a future budget year that it, it really is no fiscal impact this year okay additional comments representative Harrington yeah I, I realize uh, what the um, uh, sponsor of this bill was trying to do, but I just think there's so much stuff baggage hanging on this that it really needs to be cleaned up substantially. I mean, if you look on um, the paragraph that was just mentioned there, the Department of Energy shall s study state and federal policies, technology, supply chains, and potential siting locations related to advanced nuclear reactors. Well, that could take four people four years 
or maybe longer. It is wide open. It is no, I mean, I don't know, what would they be studying? It's, we don't have a Department of Energy that's staffed up to look into uh, all, of, all of this stuff and to come up with siting locations. I mean, all that's going to be done by a private company if and when they ever decide they want to come to New Hampshire. So that's, uh, that's one thing. And then part of the other stuff, if you look at, uh, going back to the original bill, which I think this is still in the original bill on page two as well, line, starting on line seven, it says conduct uh, studies concerning changes in laws and rules. And it goes on to talk about that would arise from the presence within the state of special nuclear materials and product materials and from the operation herein on production of utilization of facilities and blah, blah, blah. This, I assume, was put in way back before we had any nuclear facilities in the state. And if and when this law was complied to, it's already been done. Whatever administrative rules we decided we needed are put in place. And we've, like I said, we've always been dealing with special nuclear material in the state for a number of years. And uh, I'm not sure why we're going back and redoing, apparently, is what they want this to be redone. Uh, we don't even know if it's been done in the first place. So I just think this bill needs a lot of work before we do this. And like I say, assigning a study state and federal policies, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that, could be, that could be a whole department just to do that. I mean, it's just, it's, we need to really trim the stuff down, find out what has been done, what hasn't been done, what doesn't need to be done. So I just mentioned it does talk about the Public Utilities Commission in there. Uh, which has no jurisdiction over any nuclear <laughs> transactions whatsoever. It talks about the public utilities, which again, in our state where we have no, have vertically integrated utilities, no public utility is going to be making and going to be building a nuclear plant. These are things that are in the bill that are dated from whenever this was originally written 30 or 40 years ago. And I just think before we put out a bill, it appears to bring things up to speed when all we're doing is changing a few names. We, this, this needs a lot more work. Representative Parshall. Thank you, Chair. And um, I agree totally with the remarks of, our, uh, of the person to my left here. Um, one other question I would like to ask of him, if I may, though, is uh, the cost of this program when we've thus received... Um, some dire warnings about uh, revenue coming into the state and the expenses we're already putting on the book. Does this add additional expense to a program that we're looking that doesn't really have a good definition to begin with? I may, Mr. Chairman. I think that question was answered earlier when it was pointed out that this bill wouldn't take effect until after 2025, June 1st or June 30th or something. So no, it would have no immediate financial impact. But eventually, if it's as written, if it stays on the books, it would require an awful lot of studies and analysis and stuff to do. That and I that is potentially do. true. Yeah. That is potentially true. So this is an early bill. We have to make a decision about it today. Today is our last opportunity to make a decision on this bill. So I just alert you to that fact as we uh, <clears throat> prepare for our executive session at 1 o'clock. And with that... I think we're going to uh, suspend our full committee work session activity for the time being. And I'm going to call a Republican caucus in this room immediately. So I would appreciate everyone exiting the room as quickly as possible. After the uh, caucus is over, then uh, we're on lunch break until one o'clock. And we will see you all at one o'clock. Thank you very much.
Okay, everyone, <clears throat> time to get uh, back to work here. Science, Technology, and Energy for February 13th, 2024. We have an executive session coming up on three bills. And those three bills will be taken in this order. The first bill we will exec is HB 1465FN relative to studies of nuclear energy technologies. Then we will move on to HB 1644, which will have a new title. And last we'll do HB 1431. Are there any uh, announcements that need to be made before we start our exec sessions? Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we had a discussion about our field trip to uh, ISO New England, which was tentatively scheduled for the 12th of March. And as we discussed this morning, that happens to be town meeting day for many, many folks. So the alternative date now is 15 March. That's Friday. So, so uh, I will need a recount from everybody uh, on their availability. And uh, you can mull that over. And maybe at the end of executive session, we can get a count of those that know and those that are still thinking. Excellent. Thank you. OK, <clears throat> with that out of the way, let's now open an exec session on House Bill 1465 FN relative to studies of nuclear energy technologies. Chair recognizes Vice Chair Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> I motion to adopt Amendment 2024-0650H. Chair recognizes Representative Bernardi. I second that motion. Moved and seconded that we adopt Amendment 2024-0650H for House Bill 1465. Discussion. Vice Chair Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a good amendment. Pass it. Short and sweet. Additional uh, comments? Well, looks like we have none. Oh, there's Representative Partial. Yes, thank you, Chair. I would also like to, I would like to say that I still have cost concerns uh, for technology that's untried to require another employee at the Department of uh, Energy. This bill was, uh, or this amendment rather, has been vetted by the Department of Energy and they found it to be acceptable. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of the adoption of amendment 2024-0650H. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Harrington. No. Representative Lecky. Yes. Representative Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Ploget. Yes. Representative uh, Cambrils. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. Yes. Representative McWilliams. Yes. Representative Cretion. Yes. It's there. <laughs> Representative Partial. No. Representative Kaplan. Yes. Representative Munns. Yes. Representative Noel. Yes. Representative Thomas. No. Representative Corman. Yes. Representative Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Vos. Yes. 17-0, 17-3, excuse me. Okay, by a vote of 17-3, to 3, Amendment 2024-0650H is adopted. Chair recognizes Representative Vice Chair Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I motion uh, OTPA. Chair recognizes Representative Bernardi. I second the motion. Moved and seconded that we adopt the motion of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1465-FN as amended by Amendment 2024-0650-H. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. 
Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1465. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Harrington. No. Representative Lewicki. Yes. Representative Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Ploge. Yes. Representative Campbells. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. Yes. Representative McWilliams. Yes. Representative Cretion. Yes. Representative Partial. No. Representative Kaplan. Yes. Representative Munns. Yes. Representative Noel. Yes. Representative Thomas. No. Representative Corman. Yes. Representative Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Bowes. Yes. 17-3. By a vote of 17 to 3, the committee adopts House Bill or the motion of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1465-FN as amended by 2024-0650-H. Vice Chair Thomas will write the committee report unless there is a minority report. I think there will be. I, I believe Representative Thomas probably doesn't want to. Will no, there I'm, be I'm, a minority report? I think, I think on the floor there could be a report. Okay. I'll give you a, a report. Okay, Representative Thomas, Wendy Thomas will uh, write a report, and we need that report before you leave the building today. Oh, <laughs> change my mind. <laughs> you can change your mind. Well, so I I need to type it. So can I can I go home and type it and send it to you? We would prefer not. This is an early bill, and we Thomas. need this. Uh, these committee you? reports ASAP. Gotcha. Okay. All right. I got you. I got it. I got it. Okay. So we're all set with that then? All right. So let's close the exec session then on House Bill 1465. And now we'll move on to House Bill 1644. I'll open that exec session and I will move the adoption of amendment 2024-0610-H. And I recognize Representative Lewicki. I second that motion. Moved and seconded that we adopt amendment 2024-0610-H to House Bill 1644. I will start the discussion by pointing out that while this Amendment which adds nuclear powered generating facilities to the RPS is not technically a renewable form of energy. There is so much renewable energy, I mean, uh, nuclear energy fuel out there that it will be almost virtually renewable. I'll also point out that the evolution of the renewable portfolio standard will likely mean that it becomes a zero emissions portfolio standard at some point in the not too distant future. What I think this, this amendment will do is send a loud and clear message to the people of New Hampshire that this legislature is open to considering nuclear power as a future generation source. Now we all know that nuclear power is not perfect. It has, its, it has its issues and problems, but they're not insoluble, ins insolvable, I should say. And there are many, many companies working on new nuclear technologies that will be far superior to what exists here today. But I think it's important for New Hampshire to be on record as saying that we are open to nuclear generated electricity going forward. Not only are we open to it, but we recognize the imperative that nuclear energy is very likely to become a significant part of our future. Further discussion on this legislation. Representative Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, during the discussion of the bill, I raised um, 
concern about um, putting out a sign that says New Hampshire is open for business for uh, nuclear energy, admitting that that there's nothing in the immediate future. However, um, I believe it's the cart before the horse. I mean, unless we put significant guardrails in, and I realize the nuclear regulation committee is in, in charge of that or oversees that, I just... I'm, I'm telling you, I've got PTSD from St. Cobain, and I just do not see putting in other corporations that could potentially affect the community without significant oversight. Further discussion? Representative Kennedy. Yeah, I just wanted to point out, which I think already has been, that the NRC regulates nuclear power, and they are the most stringent agency you could imagine I mean, they virtually halted all nuclear development for like 30 years. So I think it will be looked at, you know, very thoroughly before anything is built. Additional discussion. Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of the adoption of the amendment 2024-0610-H. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Lewicki. Yes. Representative Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Ploge. Yes. Representative Cambrils. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. Yes. Representative McWilliams. Yes. Representative Cretion. Yes. Representative Partial. Yes. Representative Kaplan. Yes. Representative Munns. Yes. Representative Well. Yes. Representative Thomas. Uh, no. Representative Corman. Yes. Representative Reynolds. Yes. Chairman Bowes. Yes. 19-1. <clears throat> With a vote of 19 to 1 in the affirmative, the committee adopts Amendment 0610H. And I now move ought to pass as amended and rep uh, recognize Representative Lewicki. I second that motion. Moved and seconded that we adopt the motion of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1644. Any further discussion? Seeing none, as soon as you're ready, Mr. Clerk, I ask you to call the roll on the question of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1644 FN. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Wicky. Yes. Representative Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Ploge. Yes. Representative Campbells. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. Yes. Representative McWilliams. Yes. Representative Cretion. Yes. Representative Partial. Yes. Representative Kaplan. Yes. Representative Munns. Yes. Representative Noel. Yes. Representative Thomas. No. Representative Corman. Yes. Representative Reynolds. Yes. Re Chairman Bowes. Yes. 19-1. By a vote of 19 to 1, the committee adopts the recommendation of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1644 as amended by amendment number 0610H. I will write the committee report. Will there be a minority report? There will not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would there be any objection to putting this bill on the consent calendar? Hearing no objections, this bill will go on to the consent calendar. Oh, With the amendment, the FN is irrelevant. Okay, so this bill goes on to consent. Okay, with that, I'm gonna close the executive session on House Bill 1644 FN. Now, before we open an exec session on House Bill 1431, we need to have a brief discussion about where the amendment that we're going to adopt might be. Do you know Representative Kaplan? 
Okay, so we're going to take a break while we wait for the Office of Legislation, Legislative Services to produce a new version of an amendment that we think we will all like for House Bill 1431. This new amendment takes the amendment that I proposed during our work session and adds natural gas to it and retains the original amendment, the rest of the original amendment. I think that's acceptable to all parties. So as soon as we get that new amendment, we will look at it, we'll discuss it, and then we'll decide how to deal with it. So until that time, can we take a Representative Harrington? Yeah, when you say add natural gas, is it going to add natural gas as it was in the the last, there was one amendment that had natural gas in it already. Is that the one, that section of that yep. amendment? Yep. Okay. All right. Yes, I assume that's how what it will look like. I haven't seen the amendment, but um, Representative Kaplan, is that what you instructed OLS? Okay, let's take a five-minute break while uh, House Committee Services uh, prints up the amendment, and uh, then we'll come back, let's say, at uh, one thirty and take up this amendment. Before we go, Representative Bernardi has a question. While we're in this break, I want to take a poll of who can go to uh, Iceland, New England on 15 March. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to call a roll and you say yay or nay, all right? <laughs> Chairman Bowes. No. Uh-oh. Then we're not going. Vice Chairman Thomas. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Harrington. No. Representative Lewicki. Tentatively, yes. Representative Brezhny. Tentatively, yes. Bernardi, yes. Uh, Representative Ploget. Representative Summers, not here. Representative Kennedy. No. Representative McGee? No, I, already, I have an appointment that day, so I can't do it. Representative McWilliams? No, I have to work. Representative Cretion? Probably not. Representative Partial? Most likely, yes. Uh, Representative Kaplan? Yeah, I can make it. Representative Munns? No. Representative Noel? Yes. Representative Thomas? Yes. Representative Corman? No, I can't make it that day. Representative Reynolds? Uh, tentatively, yes. Okay. One, I want two, to. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We have we have eleven, including the tentatives. Thank you. Okay, please return to your seats by one thirty. Thank you.
Hey, everybody. Uh, I said we'd re begin at a restart at 1.30. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to restart at, restart at 1.30, but I want to tell you why. <laughs> so Representative Kaplan asked OLS to draft a new amendment, and they did. And he got it just before we recessed a few minutes ago or broke, uh, took a break a few minutes ago. And he was looking at it, and he discovered in the gas section, they forgot to remove the line about environmental stuff. So he went back and asked for yet another new version. <laughs> and so that version is in the works. And so we will have to wait until that one comes through before we can, um, before we can vote on this bill. So that's where we are. So I'd ask you all to stay close to your seats and Representative Kaplan will let us know the minute this new amendment arrives, and uh, we will go from there. Yeah, Christy's bringing it down as soon as it's ready, so. She, she Christy will bring it down as soon as it's ready. Okay. Mr. So, Chair. Don't go. Yeah. Yes, Representative Thomas. I'm presenting a bill at 2 o'clock, just for your information. Not here, obviously. Okay. So, um, I have a time limit. Appreciate that. You can use the time productively to write your minority report for. I just did, thanks to Re Excellent. <laughs> Representative McWilliams. It's done.
Okay, please take your seats, everyone. We can now complete our work activity for the day. We now have a new amendment for House Bill 1431. Is everyone here? It appears that we are, so the chair recognizes Representative Kaplan for a motion. Yeah, I, I move ought to pass on Amendment 2024-06-63H. Chair recognizes Representative Kennedy. Second. Moved and seconded that we adopt Amendment 2024-0663H to House Bill 1431. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Chairman? Representative Mr. Kaplan we, we, we don't to discuss have the amendment. Here. We don't have yeah, it. Yeah, we don't have it either. <laughs> it's working its way in your direction. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I forgot to give it to... <laughs> Oh. That was my fault. I apologize. I forgot to hand it to uh, Representative Bernard. We want to go fast, but not too fast. So Representative Kaplan, as uh, the text of the amendment is working its way around, why don't you describe what it does? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. This <clears throat> amendment basically uh, amends the original bill by getting us back to the original language of an assessment of it keeps 378.37, the, the uh, definition of the energy policy and, and uh, the sort of the principle, the first principle of what in, uh, integrated planning should be all about. It takes us back to the original language on the assessment of distribution infrastructure only and uh, states that the, the assessments of the, any assessment of a plan's integration has to be consistent with the state energy strategy. Uh, and then it goes on to add some language around gas distribution, gas utilities as well, <clears throat> so that the gas utilities are also included in the need to file integrated plans. So I think this amendment gets the Public Utilities Commission back to its, it gives it a tool to get back to its oversight duty over our state's utilities. Uh, and it also has the, uh, the, the virtue of simplicity and uh, and uh, you know efficiency, so that we don't get bogged down in these proceedings. So, I think it meets uh, I think it meets our needs. Thank you, Representative Kaplan. As I read the amendment, it does exactly what Representative Kaplan uh, suggested that it would do. It takes an earlier amendment and adds gas to it. And that's it. And so um, I think this amendment passes muster, and I think we uh, should seriously consider passing it. Were there any extra copies? Could Mr. Lakata? Oh, he has one. Okay. I just wanted to make sure he had one. There are some extra copies here if anybody needs them. A couple of extra copies here if anybody would like to. Uh, to peruse this amendment. Okay, further discussion on the amendment. Representative Corman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I still have one reservation here. There was something in uh, amendment, one that we were looking at before, 0609H, about that uh, no distribution rate change would be approved or ordered until a plan had been approved. And that's no longer here. And I'm just concerned that there's really no teeth in this, that the timing repeats until a plan is approved, but there's, there's nothing about, all right, well, until you approve a plan, you, you don't get to change your distribution rates. So I'm just a little concerned about that. So during the public hearing, it was that issue was addressed by, I think it was Mr. Franz of the Department of Energy. And he stated that you could run seriously into a constitutional issue there of depriving the ability, the utility of the ability to recover its costs prudently. And so he suggested that no enforcement mechanism was really necessary for this bill. And so that's why my original amendment took it out and why Representative Kaplan agreed that that, that was a suitable change. 
if I could just add a comment on that, I, I think the fact that the utilities are on board with this process says a lot. Uh, and if, if that's the case and they're carrying out these plans in, in a, you know, a sort of good faith effort, that that is good enough for me. Further discussion? Seeing none, it looks like we can ask the clerk to call the roll on the question of the adoption of the amendment. Amendment 0663H. Was there a motion on that? Yes. I, I, All done. Who, who, Representative Kaplan, Kaplan moved the adoption of the amendment and Representative Kennedy seconded the ah, motion. Good. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll on the adoption of the amendment. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Wicke. Yes. Representative Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Plogé. Yes. Representative Campbells. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. Yes. Representative McWilliams. Yes. Representative Cretion. Yes. Representative Partial. Yes. Representative Kaplan. Yes. Representative Munns. Yes. Representative Well. Yes. Representative Thomas. Yes. Representative Corman. Yes. Representative Reynolds. Mm. Yes. Chairman Bowes. Yes. 20-0. By a vote of 20 to nothing, the committee adopts Amendment 0663H for House Bill 1431. Chair now recognizes Representative Kaplan for a motion. I move that uh, we adopt HB 1431 uh, as amended. OTP. Chair recognizes Representative Chair recognizes Representative Kennedy. I second. Moved I second and seconded the that we adopt the motion of ought to pass as amended on House Bill 1431. Any further discussion needed? Seeing none, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll on the question of ought to pass as amended. Vice Chair Thomas. Yes. Representative Nodder. Yes. Representative Harrington. Yes. Representative Wicke. Yes. Representative Brezhny. Yes. Representative Bernardi. Yes. Representative Plogé. Yes. Representative Campbells. Yes. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative McGee. Yes. Representative McWilliams. Yes. Representative Cretion. Yes. Representative Partial. Yes. Representative Kaplan. Yes. Representative Munns. Yes. Representative Noel. Yes. Representative Thomas. Yes. Representative Corman. Yes. Representative Reynolds. Yes. Rep uh, Chairman Bowes. Yes. 20 to 0. By a vote of 20 to nothing, the motion of ought to pass as amended is adopted by the committee. Without objection, we'll put this bill on the consent calendar. No objection. Representative Kaplan no will. Write the committee report. <laughs> I wasn't expecting you to object. <laughs> Although maybe you will object to writing the committee report. But you're on the hook, nevertheless. And you have to write it before you leave this afternoon, so. Check in with Rebecca. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to close the executive session on House Bill 1431 and that really concludes our business for the day. So I will remind everyone that we will meet again, weather permitting, next Tuesday, which is February 20th, at 10 a.m. for a full committee work session on the last three bills that we have before us for this session. And then at one o'clock that afternoon, we'll have an exec session on those same three bills. And I will attempt to send out amendments for those bills if needed by this Friday, if possible. Representative Nodder. Um, just clarification, did you say, you said 10 a.m., but did you mean 9 a.m.? No, I meant 10 a.m. Okay. Unless there's an objection. Does, does anybody want to start at 9? No. I thought 10 would be a better t start time, especially since every other Tuesday this room is 
used from nine to 10 by another group. Yep. So I thought it'd be safe to start at 10. Anything else? See you all next Tuesday. Have a wonderful rest of the week and a nice weekend. And happy Valentine's Day to all of you.